This is the FL Sun Q Cricut 3D printer. As you can see, it's a Delta 3D printer that has a really good build volume and some interesting features for the price. The build volume on this is 260 millimeters on the bed by 350 millimeters tall. The linear drive system for this is powered by three NEMA 17 motors running on GT2 belts, and the entire linear system is running on eight millimeter rods. Now, instead of using the standard bearings, the LM8UU bearings, they went ahead with and used bushings instead. Now these do end up being a little bit more effort to maintain because you do have to periodically grease the rods in order to make it run smooth, but they also give you the grease so maintenance isn't really a big deal. It has a top print speed of about 150 millimeters a second and during my prints, 80 millimeters a second was absolutely no problem for it so it was quite quick. The assembly of this printer should be fairly quick for anybody with any bit of experience because it arrives kind of like the CR10 only in Delta form where most of the assembly is already done. The electronics and everything are already wired in the base, so all you have to do is install the smooth rods, install the belts, put the top and bottom on it, as well as these plates, and of course you have to install the hot end, and you are ready to go. Now unfortunately, my printer actually arrived to me damaged in transit. I know it was working when it left the factory, because they did do a test print on it beforehand, but when I got it, the six nylon screws that hold the heat bed on had all been broken off. Now it was well packed, but the box did look like it had seen some battle damage, so I'm pretty sure it was just a rough ride and not indicative of the quality of the bed. Including reattaching the bed, the assembly took me about two hours from start to beginning first print, and uh, it was a fairly simple process. The auto leveling on this printer is pretty rudimentary. The actual hot end acts as the switch for detecting the bed, and the bed acts as ground, so when the two make contact, it's able to register how far down it had to go and then map out 36 different points to figure out the overall layout of the bed. So this has some pluses and minuses. The minuses as I see them are the fact that you have to make sure that both the nozzle and the bed are completely clean before you start. If there's anything interfering with its ability to make contact, it's not going to register the contact and you're going to end up grinding your gears. Now they have an interesting solution for that if you want to have something on your bed. They include this material which acts as an adhesive surface to print onto and also is conductive which means that the auto level will run with it on there. Now the unfortunate part is this is actually sticky and it loses its stickiness after only a few prints which makes it useless to use. In addition if you have any fail prints this residue gets on it from your print and they do not come off cleanly and scraping it off actually removes that adhesive. What I ended up doing for the most part was switching to captain tape so I cleaned the bed completely, ran the auto level, then applied my captain tape, and in the configuration on the main menu, I uh, corrected for the increased thickness of the captain tape, and it worked flawless all the way through. The first print I did was, of course, a standard Benchy. This was printed in some generic white PLA that came with my CR10. It turned out really nice. There's no curling on the bow. The overhangs are all very reasonably done. There was no additional string or anything like that, which was also a concern because of the length of the Bowden tube in this setup, and overall I was pretty satisfied with the way it looked. Once the Benchy was done and I was happy with the results, it was time to switch to the included PLA. It came with an entire full roll of blue PLA, something that you don't usually see with printers. So I switched to it and I loaded up the Adelinda model and basically maxed it out for the size of the build volume and let it print. 18 hours later, and this was the result. I have to admit, I was really impressed with this print. With the exception of one of the un overhangs on the belly, the, printer turned, or the print turned out practically flawless. The details are all really nice. I think the only thing I would change if I were doing it again would be to increase the infill, because you can see a little bit of the infill lines through the actual surface. This used less than 200 grams worth of material, and I went with like a 10% infill, so I think 15% and it would have been perfect. Well, with the confidence in the printer building, it was time to try and move on to some other materials. I switched to PETG, and PETG actually had some struggles. I had a roll of green PETG that no matter what I did, increasing the temperature, slowing or speeding up the print, I just couldn't get it to complete more than four or five layers. So I went ahead and ordered a brand new roll of blue PETG. And after increasing the temperature to 260, which is a little bit higher than I generally go, this was the print. There's very little stringing, once again there's no curling in the bow, and the print looks really really nice with the exception of some additional material up on the stack. Well, now I knew it could print PETG, so I figured I'd throw flexibles at it, and another Benchy, and this was the result. 
Uh, I printed at 30 millimeters a second, which is pretty reasonable for a flexible print. The Benchy itself, the core part of it, turned out really nice. Uh, the stack, unfortunately, did suffer a little bit, as did some of the uh, details in the actual um, the actual cabin of the boat, where there was little material to put down. So I think overall you can expect some decent flexible prints for stuff like phone cases and stuff, but higher detailed items are probably not going to turn out perfect. I like to throw wood filament at any printer I put together, and this one handled it like a champ. This is the first time that we saw some stringing, which has been an issue with this wood filament for me on other printers, so I wasn't overly surprised to see it. Again, the bow turned out perfect, the text on the bottom is nice and legible, and uh, even the text on the back of it almost shows up, which doesn't happen very often. There was some discoloration on the stack, where it was spending more time with the filament getting heated up. Um, Wood filament often changes color depending on the temperature it's printed at, so having it go slower through the hot end means that it gets heated up a little bit more, which can affect the color of the actual print. I loaded up some basic white ABS and started off a print, and I unfortunately accidentally cancelled it beforehand. Um, it was turning out absolutely perfect, the layers were adhering to each other well. Uh, again, no curling, no uh, imperfections to speak of. The writing on the bottom isn't quite as legible, and that's because I did lower the first layer just a little bit just to make sure that I got that bed adhesion right down. And unfortunately, this is where I actually ran into my first kind of major problem with the printer. You see, when I was getting ready to print a larger ABS print, I accidentally heated the bed up to 120, which it did no problem, and that was fine. So I brought the temperature down and started to print, and about four or five layers in, all of a sudden, the printer just lost power. So I do what you would do with all electronics, I switched it off for 10 seconds and turned it back on and up it came again and everything looked like it was going to be fine. Until I started to heat the bed again and then the power went out. So then I flipped over the printer to take a look and see what was going on with the electronics and this is what I found. Now as far as I can determine, because my original thought was that the connector where the 12 volt rail goes into the board wasn't sufficient for the amperage, but it looks like it should have been. So after inspecting the wires a little bit closer, it looks like when it was manufactured and when the wires were installed, the person that was tightening the terminals down tightened into the insulation versus the wire. The wire wasn't making good contact with the connector, and as a result the resistance was increased, which generates heat, which damages the wires, which leads to this situation. Now, at this point I contacted GearBest, and they said they were willing to send me out a new board, absolutely no problem, but in this case, it's a pretty simple fix if you know your way around to soldering iron. So I desoldered the connectors and soldered wires directly to the board, and this clears up any issues there might be with a lack of connectivity. Unfortunately, unbeknownst to me at this point, the board wasn't the only thing damaged. So after getting it back up and running, about five or six hours into printing, all of a sudden the power supply just popped. Now, this was something I was kind of anticipating could happen. The power supply had to work a lot harder to keep forcing the power through those damaged wires with the increased resistance in order to be able to keep the bed and everything up to temperature and I think this basically just wore it down prematurely and it died. So I contacted GearBest Support again, I explained the situation and they actually offered to send me a replacement printer right away. Ultimately I opted not to do that mostly because I just wanted to be able to get the review done on it and I had a replacement power supply that would work fine. So I wired up the new power supply during a live stream and I also added lights inside the columns which is going to make for really nice time lapses in the future. Once the printer was back up and running and the power supply was replaced, we decided during the live stream that we should try something silly, and I printed this Benchy. This is printed in pink PLA, and there is a little bit of a layer shift. And the reason for that is I actually printed this with the printer on its side. So you can imagine, basically the entire print ends up being one giant overhang as it lays down the layers. Uh, it looked like it was going to handle absolutely no problem. Once that first layer was well stuck, the rest of it just built on top of it, and uh, yeah, other than that one layer shift, it was uh, it was no struggle for it at all. The layer shift occurred because I decided to push it to see how fast we could go, and I think it was about 240 millimeters a second before it finally missed a step and uh, led, led to that happening. Well, with it back up and running, I decided to go ahead and print off the faceless model, and it turned out really nice, except for I really had to slow the printer down to get it done, at least until the swords make contact with the legs. This is a complicated print because the swords come off on an angle whereby it really tests your overhang ability, and uh, they're so small that it's very easy to accidentally knock them off. So this was about the third attempt, and I slowed it down to about 50 millimeters a second, which was fairly reasonable. Now, the issue with the overhang on the faceless model actually highlights one of the design flaws in this printer. 
So it has a kind of V5 crossover V6 clone hot end in it. So it's got a uh, heat block that looks a lot like the V5, but the actual heatsink seems to be about the same size as the V6. And then on either side of that heatsink is a fan that acts as a blower fan for the part. Now this should be a really good combination and it should be able to print PLA like a champ, but unfortunately the actual shrouds coming off those fans point straight down versus towards the nozzle. As a result, the part that's getting printed doesn't have direct cooling and if you're printing something that just has small details, the cooling may miss it entirely. Now this will be a pretty simple fix, I'm going to be able to print off shrouds that will actually direct the airflow where I want it, and it makes me kind of wonder why they didn't do that in the first place. I tested out the power outage recovery mode, and it looks like it should work, but unfortunately it didn't finish my model successfully. So I killed the power to it, then brought it back up, and sure enough the display said, would you like to resume? So I clicked the resume button, and it reheats the bed and it reheats the hot end, but then when it comes down to print, unfortunately where the nozzle was making contact with the print previously, it left a little bump, and that little bump was enough that when it started printing again, it bounced off there, lost a step, and caused layer shifting. So in a larger print, this may not happen, and when it comes down to it, the power outage thing should work in lots of cases, and you really have nothing to lose by giving it a shot if the power does go out. So I'm not going to hold it against it, it's just happenstance, unfortunately, that it may or may not work for you. It has an all-metal extruder that's mounted up at the top with a piece of Bowden tube going through the top surface, which leads to the integrated spool holder that's on the actual top of the unit. The test print that they did on the printer before sending out was this, which sits on top of a bearing on top of the printer. So then your spool sits on top of there and it spins. Now, I don't mind this design, but the problem with this actual piece that they designed is that it's pretty specific for the type of uh, filament that'll sit on top of it. I have a lot of rolls that the hole is just too small to fit on top of this, and as a result I was having to use another spool holder. So all I did was hop into Fusion 360, and I went with this sort of pyramid approach so that any one of the sizes of uh, filament I have will fit on top of it, and then it just rests on top of the bearing like the original one, and that fixes the problem no problem at all. I also wanted to have some fun with the printer, so I picked a couple of cool models to print off. So the first one was from a uh, designer on YouTube called Eskewed View 3D. And this is Hulk's hammer from Thor Ragnarok. So it printed with supports and some generic red PLA, and uh, the details look pretty decent on it. Now the overhangs didn't turn out perfectly and the uh, support material didn't clean off perfectly, uh, but this is an issue that I have had with this red PLA before, and uh, that in com combination with the fact that the cooling fans really aren't optimal for cooling stuff off meant that it kind of uh, stuck to its support material a little too well. I also picked this print from my good buddy Daryl over at The Broken Nerd, and uh, so I picked this lightsaber that he modeled after Ben Solo's lightsaber in the latest two Star Wars movies. So it turned out really nice, it was an 18 hour print, uh, it's printed in lavender PLA from filaments.ca, and I really have no complaints about it. Uh, it's one of the models that I was looking forward to sanding and finishing, so I figured while I'm testing the printer I might as well print off some stuff I can use. And by the way, if you haven't checked out Daryl's channel beforehand, you should, and I'm going to go ahead and toss a link up right over right over here, somewhere. Um, he does a lot of his own designs and prints, and his builds turn out phenomenal. So now it's time to weigh the pros and cons on this printer. The pros as I see them are the fact that the auto level works on it very well. The interface is easy to use for newcomers, so you can just slice your stuff, put it on the model, and then use the touchscreen to do it. The build volume is big, the print quality is very nice, and it also is almost designed to be enclosed. The sides of it are flat, which means that you can use anything from plexiglass to styrofoam to cover them up, and uh, you'll have a nice little machine for printing ABS where all the heat is contained within the box. I also see very easy modifications being done to it to bring it to an even better printing machine by redesigning the ducts for the cooling on here. But unfortunately, there are also the negatives that I ran into. Now, I'm not going to dock at points for the broken bed, as I really do believe that it was just badly handled during shipping, as can happen. But unfortunately, the wiring of the power supply is the kind of thing where, if you're buying this printer, I'm going to warn you to check for it ahead of time to make sure that it's properly installed. And also monitor the temperature of those wires for the first, you know, couple hundred hours of printing. Look for any signs of thermal damage. If you really want to be safe, desolder that connector and solder the wires directly to it. This is really a superior solution anyways because 
you completely avoid the chance that those those wires are going to work their way loose. When it comes down to it, if you're a first-time printer buyer and you don't want something that you may have to fiddle with or work on, then this would be one to pass on. This isn't going to be guaranteed out of the box to work flawless. If on the other hand you know your way around a soldering iron, this is still very good bang for the buck. The build volume is nice and big, you can print some really nice impressive big prints off of it, and with just a little bit of tinkering you can turn it into a really nice printer. So overall, I'm satisfied with my purchase on this printer. Even with all the extra time and effort I had to put into it, I did enjoy it. This one didn't get to the point where it was too laborious for me to not enjoy using it. If you do find yourself wanting one of these after my review, I've gone ahead and linked to it in the description below, so feel free. If this is your first time to the channel, welcome, and I'd invite you to subscribe and click the bell so you're notified when I put out new content. Uh, if you have any questions or comments for future reviews, then toss them down below. I'm glad to hear them, and until next time, stay creative.